The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. I'm telling you, Max, Sega Genesis does what Nintendo don't. Such lies. Well, it does what Nintendo didn't, because it was in the past, and actually it did what Nintendo didn't. Oh, that is such a load of crap. Have you played Star Fox? It renders hundreds of on-screen polygons. Yeah, but at what cost? It required an additional coprocessor inside of the cartridge. That cost a lot of money, and that money came out of kids' pockets. They had to mow so many extra lawns that summer. I know, I know that it caused the lawn mowing heat stroke epidemic of 93, but I have one word for you, Chrono Trigger best game ever made. Yeah, for the five people who bought it. Hey, come on guys, do you want the neighbors to call the cops on us again? What I want is for Max to admit the truth, that the Sega Genesis is the single greatest 16-bit video game console of all time. You know I'm never gonna do that. Hey, since we have all this awesome test equipment, why don't we take the systems apart and analyze them scientifically? Fine, we'll settle this once and for all. There can be only one. <laughs> Amazing hacks. How can we make this portable? Inspired designs. I am the internet troll. Regrettable acting. Bend them hatches! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Hack Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. In today's episode, we're going to compare the Super Nintendo to the Sega Genesis. We'll take both consoles apart and then look at the main processor, the coprocessors, if any, the audio, the video, and see how much RAM is in each console. We'll then hook up both consoles to an oscilloscope and look at the actual low-level read-write speeds of their buses. Let's get started. Let's take a look at the physical parts inside of the Sega Genesis to see how it will fare in the battle. The heart of the Sega Genesis is the Motorola 68000 processor. This is a, um, actually it's a internal 32-bit processor, but its output bus is 16 bits. So it's, you know, pretty advanced for its time. Look how big it is, it's huge, that's ridiculous. Anyway, this chip was used in a lot of old computers such as the original Macintosh, the Amiga, and the Atari ST. In the Atari ST, the ST stands for 1632 referring to its 16-bit data bus and 32-bit internal registers. Let's see what else we have. Oh, look at these wires. So clearly they had uh, room for either a wide dip or a narrow dip here. And these wires basically let them mod in that they're not using the wide dip. So these are gonna be two RAM chips. Let's see, 256 uh, divided by eight means that's 32K each, okay. And these are probably the work RAM. So that's 64K of work RAM. What they probably do is they probably have this um, as a 16-bit word. So even though these are 8-bit RAM chips, they have one be the low byte of a word, a 16-bit word, and the other one is the high byte. So as they pull data off them, they're actually pulling the words off them in parallel. It was pretty common back then. One thing they would do a lot also is they'd have eight one-bit RAMs and they'd pull a single byte off of them in parallel. What else do we have here? Oh, the Z80, the classic processor that we used in the ZX or ZX Spectrum project. Now, this is an eight-bit CPU that was used in numerous computers back in the 80s, but most noticeably the Sega Master System, this was the main CPU on that. And by using this in the Genesis as the audio processor, it allows backward compatibility with the Master System games. So this is almost like a Master System with the Genesis stuck on top of it. They had that power-based converter thing so you could play the Master System games. There actually wasn't anything inside of that. All it did was adapt the shape of the cartridge slot. You can plug Master System games basically right into this and they'll work. Right next to the Z80, we see another RAM chip. To figure out the size of it, we look for a number such as 64 or 128, and that's 64K bits. So if you want to figure out its size in bytes, you divide that by eight. So that's an 8K RAM. So this would be the same 8K RAM that the Sega Master System had hooked up to the Z80, but in this case, this is used to run the audio. So basically it has its own little audio coprocessor. If it's like the Neo Geo, you can completely halt the 68K and this will keep making music and sounds. So there's two custom chips here. They both say Sega. 
Uh, based off their orientation, I'm gonna guess that this is a bus arbiter or glue logic chip. It basically ties the whole system together like a rug. Probably gives you your IO for the joysticks and everything else as well. This other large chip here is the video display processor that creates the graphics. It's an evolution of the one that was in the Sega Master System, which itself was an evolution of the one in the ColecoVision and MSX. Wow, that goes back a long ways. This chip has all the same modes that the Master System did for backwards compatibility, plus new modes for the Sega Genesis. It's kind of hard to see here, but these chips that look kind of like uh, array of resistors are actually RAM. They're very strange looking. So this is going to be your video RAM, 64K or 32K each. And the video RAM is accessed by the VDP. So the Motorola doesn't have direct access to this. Instead, the Motorola has to tell this chip to fill this. Over here, we have a Yamaha music synthesizer that's controlled by the Z80. And connected to the synthesizer, we have two Sony chips that are probably being used for some sort of audio filtering of some kind. All right, that's the main overview of the system. Now let's hook it up to the scope and see how fast it can go. The Sega Genesis has a nice expansion port where we can probably get all the signals that we need for testing. I don't have exactly the right card edge connector to fit onto it. So what I did was I took two card edge connectors and cut them up. So one will go on the left and one will go on the right. Let's make sure all the connections are good. This one's a little bit to the left. There we go. I always walk the pin down the line. So that one's connected. Then I always hit the next one to make sure there's no short circuit. Then I hit the next one, short circuit test. Because if you just did this, you wouldn't know if there are any possible short circuits. So that's why I always walk it down the line. Looks like everything works. I'm gonna glue this together and then we can use it to make our test rig. I wanna look at the data bus of the Sega Genesis using the Tektronix logic probe. So I took the uh, octopus looking thing off of it and I'm left with a header. So I can make it so this header plugs right into this expansion board that I'm working on. So what I'm gonna do is wire it up using the reference of the expansion pinout and the pinout of the logic probe. The logic analyzer probe has 16 channels. We're going to hook up the first eight channels to the beginning of the address bus and the second eight channels to the beginning of the data bus. This should show us the proper speeds even though we won't see all the signals. I wired up the address bus to the first connector and I'm gonna wire up the data bus to the second connector. That way we can compare them when they change on the oscilloscope. The logic analyzer has two cables coming out of it. Each cable has eight logic pins on it and an eight by two header. I'm attaching eight by two male headers onto our expansion board so we can plug the logic analyzer probe directly into it. Confused yet? I'm also adding a 200 ohm resistor onto each signal. Let's switch on the Genesis. All right, we can see it cooking. So this is the uh, Aladdin game that came out in like in 1993. This is actually a really good game. So there were licensed games before GoldenEye that didn't suck. Not a lot, but a few. Anyway, let's take a look at the scope. Got a close up here. This is all the data going by. And the uh, first eight lines are the address and the second eight are the data. So what I wanna do is I actually look, try to find the minimum pulse width so I can get an idea of its speed. The Sega Genesis uh, the CPU is clocked at 7.67 uh, megahertz, but that's not actually how fast I might run. Some instructions take multiple cycles, so you don't actually always get to that much speed. Modern stuff you do, not old stuff. Okay, I'm gonna do a stop here and see what we can find. Okay, what is the smallest pulse we can find? 200 nanoseconds would be five megahertz. Let's see. Yeah, it's definitely running at least five megahertz. See how we zoom in here and we see that the zoom scale is 200 nanoseconds and we have pulses that, the, basically the minimum pulse width that we see is 200 nanoseconds. I have a hard time thinking backwards from that, but if you think about nanoseconds are thousands of, well, no, nanoseconds are billions of a second. Um, but if you think about one megahertz being one microsecond or one million cycles per second, so if you have something that's 200 nanoseconds, it's one fifth or five times faster than one microsecond, which would be about five megahertz. Everybody got that? So what we can do is we can analyze these minimum pulse widths and compare them to the minimum pulse widths on the Super Nintendo. But yeah, it looks like 200 nanoseconds is pretty common. Now it's time for a tech timeout. 
Silicon wafers, such as these, are used to make integrated circuits. Freescale Semiconductor sent this batch up ahead of time for the Freescale Technology Forum in Austin, Texas, the week of June 22nd. I signed all of these and will be shipping them back. I'm going to be a participant at the Freescale Technology Forum, and if you stop by the Newark Element 14 booth, you can sign up for a chance to win one of these puppies in a fancy frame. We'll see you then. Let's take a look at the Super Nintendo components. We have the 5A22 CPU, which is a custom CPU made by Nintendo, based off the 65C816 CPU, which was actually used on the Apple IIGS as well. So this thing and the Apple IIGS have the same CPU. It's kind of interesting because the Apple IIGS had a backwards compatibility mode to run Apple II software. Its CPU could run in 8-bit or 16-bit mode, which kind of makes you wonder, was this thing supposed to be backwards compatible for the old Nintendo? Because the old Nintendo had a 6502 just like the Apple II. So in theory, this chip could possibly run old Nintendo games. So here's 128K of work RAM. That's quite a bit. That's a lot more than the Genesis has. Then that's connected to the two picture processing units, or PPUs, that's the same thing Nintendo called the video chip in the original Nintendo. It's actually two of these guys, they work as one, and they're controlled by the CPU to draw the graphics. And much like the Genesis, the two PPUs have their own RAM. Uh, again, 64K of video RAM that's controlled by them for making the pictures, so the CPU basically tells these chips what to do with this RAM. I also noticed in the schematics there is a port connected between the custom RAM chip and the PPUs. There's probably some sort of fast block access with the RAM that they could do. Copy it from, you know, the work RAM into the PPUs and then into the video RAM. Oh my stars and garters! There are two chips on here that say Nintendo and Sony on them. Ah! Dogs and cats living together! Mass hysteria! Okay, so um, one of these is a small CPU that actually runs the audio, and the other one is the audio processor. So basically these chips work together, just like the Z80 and the Yamaha chip work together in the Genesis. And a big difference here is that there are two RAM chips for the audio itself, giving it a total of 64K of audio RAM. One thing the Super Nintendo audio could do that was really cool is you could store a sample, like a keyboard, ding! and then play that back at any frequency you wanted to create different notes, just like a modern synthesizer does. So clearly the, in the audio department, the Super Nintendo was leagues above the Genesis. Now I'm going to make an adapter for the Super Nintendo as well. The Super Nintendo also had an expansion port like the Genesis, but there aren't nearly as many pins on it. There isn't a complete bus. So what I'm gonna do is use the cartridge slot to get my connections from. And I'm gonna make it so I can plug the Logic Probe directly into it, just like the Genesis. Using the Sega Genesis expansion port that we wired for reference, I'm connecting two headers onto a piece of perf board to use with the Super Nintendo. The Super Nintendo doesn't have a full expansion port like the Sega Genesis does, so we're going to be attaching these probes directly to the bottom of the cartridge port. This is the easiest way to get the data and address signals. Now we're gonna try the Super Nintendo using Castlevania 4 which is a very expensive game, strangely enough, for a launch title that came out 24 years ago. One thing very limiting about the Super Nintendo is its CPU only has an 8-bit data bus. So to perform 16-bit calculations, it actually has to do two loads. It has to load in two sets of data. So on top of its lower clock speed, it also has that working against it. So I'm pretty sure we're gonna see a lot lower speeds on this compared to the Sega Genesis. And a big pet peeve of mine is people who say S-N-E-S, -E like it's two different words. No, it's SNES. So I always call it SNES. Sounds like a Dr. Seuss character. The SNES lived under the bridge and ate people, but it wanted to learn the true meaning of Christmas. <laughs> okay. All right, let's power up this game. Okay, let's let this go into a track mode. And while we wait for a track mode to start, I'm gonna look at some of these pulses. I'll set it to the same as this, as the Genesis. So this is at um, 200 nanoseconds per division. 
I'm gonna look for the pulses on the data line. Okay, there's one. Yeah, so this is quite a bit slower. If you think about the Sega Genesis, it was doing a single operation in 200 nanoseconds. This is more like 400, so let me see if it actually speeds up ever. Let's look for some more data. Let's get some caps of the game actually in action. 400 nanoseconds. Let's get another one here. It's definitely half the speed of the Genesis, if not worse. And then keep in mind, it could be even slower than that because depending on what part of the system it's accessing, the CPU speeds can get down to like under two megahertz, which is pretty lame, but it makes up for it by having really good audio and video. These two views show the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis as seen on the scope. The time division is 200 nanoseconds, which means each dotted line represents 200 nanoseconds of time. The Sega Genesis performs an operation within 200 nanoseconds, which is about five megahertz. The Super Nintendo does its minimum operation in about 400 nanoseconds, half the speed of the Sega Genesis, or about 2.5 megahertz. Let's take a look at the difference between the hardware we found in the Super Nintendo and the Genesis. The Genesis has a 7.67 megahertz Motorola 68K processor, while the Super Nintendo only has a 3.58 megahertz processor. Also, the Genesis processor has internal 32-bit registers, which is pretty awesome, and a 16-bit data bus, whereas the Super Nintendo only has an 8-bit data bus, probably for backwards compatibility, like the Apple II GS we talked about. So not only is it half the speed, but the Super Nintendo has to do twice the work to access the same amount of data that the Genesis can do in a single cycle. As far as RAM, well, the Super Nintendo has twice as much work RAM, so that's not even a contest. Video RAM, they have the same amount. The Super Nintendo has more colors than the graphics on the Genesis, so even though this is the same amount, 64K on the Super Nintendo probably actually holds less pixels because there's more data per pixel, so you actually get less pixels with the same amount of space, which is probably why the Genesis can move the screens around faster. It doesn't have to reload the graphics as much as the Super Nintendo does because the graphics don't take as much data, if that makes sense. So the RAM is the same, but you can fit more of the low resolution bad graphics in a Genesis RAM than you can in the higher resolution better graphics Super Nintendo. Audio RAM, again, not a contest. Super Nintendo has 64K that it uses for samples. The samples sound really cool. However, you're limited to whatever samples you have. Whereas the Sega Genesis just uses that 8K to hold the notes or basically the, the score, if you will, that gets put through the Z80 and then controls the Yamaha synthesizer. This 8K is also used for backwards compatibility with the Sega Master System. The total, 136 versus 256. The winner is Super Nintendo even though it's so slow. Now it's time for the final conclusions. The Genesis is fast. It has a fast processor with a 32-bit internal register, 16-bit data bus, so it can get a lot more data in one shot than the Super Nintendo does. Major limitations, only 64 colors on screen at once. If you think about like Mortal Kombat on the Genesis versus Mortal Kombat on the Super Nintendo, night and day. I mean, the Genesis looked a lot worse. Uh, the audio synthesizer is also fairly old. You know, it has like quite a few channels of sound, but they all sound very Genesis-y. But it did have nice bass. Super Nintendo is colorful. It has great graphics and great music, but it is slow. That 8-bit data bus doesn't help things, and the music is limited to the samples you can fit into RAM. So it really comes down to, do you want to play fast games or you want to play pretty looking games, a lot of memory, which is why the Genesis was better for shooters, Sonic the Hedgehog, sports games, whereas the Super Nintendo really excelled at Mario games, colorful worlds, and RPGs. Well, Max, I guess I was wrong. Oh, wait, wait, I, I gotta get this on camera. All right, I'm recording. Well, Max, I guess I was wrong. The Sega Genesis isn't clearly superior to the Super Nintendo. And I learned something too. All the great graphics and sound effects in the world can make up for Super Nintendo's laughably slow processor. Well, that's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we're going to be finishing the Teensy Pinball Machine, which, ironically, has better specs than the Super Nintendo and Genesis combined. <laughs> we'll see you then. You just can't kill Dracula. Even if you kill him, he's not dead. Because there's only an eight dip. If you ever run the teleprompter that slow, I will get mad. Oh, I know, I know that it caused the lawn mowing heat stroke of 93 <laughs> epidemic. Ah. Hey, you know, since we already got these 
Get the part on the table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yes, I know it caused the lawn mowing heat stroke epidemic of 93. <laughs> <laughs> Hundreds of lives were lost. Hey, hey, do you want the cops to call the neighbors? <laughs> yes, call yes, I know that it caused the lawn mowing epidemic of 19. Lawn mowing <laughs> epidemic? <laughs> there can be only one. <laughs> That was my weakness all along. <laughs> the Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.